They were thrilled to, um, to turn the page back to the Stanford Department of Management Science and Engineering. Um, Dr. Kathleen Eisenhardt has a, a long history with, with Google from the early days to the present. And she, in fact, wrote the book on strategy as Structured Chaos. And so um, her course is one of the more popular ones in the department. Um, hopefully, there's some, um, some veterans here in the audience. And she's here to talk to us today about her new book, which is The, um, the Attention to Simple Rules. And it gives us the tools to, co to cope with complexity, tells us when to get things done, and when to change course. Um, Dr. Eisenhardt is also the um, co-director of the Stanford Technology Ventures Program. And so if you have any questions uh, during the uh, presentation, we have a microphone right here. And otherwise, please join me in welcoming Dr. Eisenhardt back to Google. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. Anyway, thanks a lot for taking the time this afternoon to, uh, to join me. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about is, is obviously the book, uh, Strategy, or Simple Rules, How to Thrive in a Complex World. Um, I want to start out by, uh, by a scenario. And this is the story of uh, Sergeant Edward Montoya. At the time of the story, he's stationed in Mosul. Uh, he's a member of the US Army. He's in line around Christmas time, getting some dessert. Uh, and as he's standing there, suddenly somebody blows themselves up, a terrorist and there's carnage throughout the mess hall. Sergeant Montoya is quick enough to get under a table, but when he emerges, it's, it's a mess. And he's a medic, and he has to decide what is he going to do in this very complex, very uncertain time. Who does he treat? Who doesn't he treat? Who gets, who gets the priority? And the theme of the day, as you, as, as you know, is simple rules. And what he actually falls back on is the, is the medical rules of triage, who really needs treatment now versus who can wait versus who it's really, it's really never going to work for. And the story is the same for uh, that grandmotherly-looking woman, which I'm sure you all, whom, whom I'm sure you all know, Janet Yellen. Janet Yellen runs the U.S. economy, at least in part, on simple rules. In fact, although she may be changing her rule, but she has been um, usefully pointing out that she won't raise interest rates until unemployment is below 5% and inflation is over 2%, which was useful for a long time for the markets to get a you know, sense of stability in businesses as well. I think she's starting to think about changing that rule, though. Mark Zuckerberg as well at Facebook, and crickets. Crickets have simple rules too, because even though their world isn't complex, their brain isn't either. <laughs> so what are simple rules? Simple rules are shortcut strategies that save time and effort by focusing your attention and simplifying how you think. So that's basic, basically rules of thumb. You can think of it as that. A couple key features of what's a simple rule. Simple rules are simple, meaning two, three, four, five, maybe six. Secondly, simple rules depend on the person and the situation. Your rules aren't necessarily my rules. And then finally, simple rules relate to a defined activity. They're not related to, they're not platitudes like always be nice to your mother. Uh, rather, they, they're focused on a particular process or activity that you do. Let me give you some examples to bring this down out of hyperspace. Uh, the simple rules of Michael Pollan. Michael Pollan is the UC Berkeley professor of journalism and the author of Omnivore's Dilemma, Botany of Desire, and some other books. I don't know whether these rules are on your refrigerator, but they are on a lot of refri people's refri refrigerators. And his rules are eat real food that your grandmother would recognize, number one. Number two, eat small portions. Number three, eat mostly plants. Within that, you do what you want. You have blueberries, you have kale, you have squash, you have the occasional fish or chicken, and just but do what you want to do, but you have those follow those three simple rules. So simple rules. Second point, simple rules depend on the person in the situation. So it turns out the Stanford football team also has simple rules for eating. Uh, but as you might imagine, they aren't the same as middle-aged Michael Pollan. The Stanford football team's rules are always eat breakfast because they're college kids who stay up late, get up late, and often skip breakfast. Their second rule is stay hydrated because they're busy boys, very athletic. It's easy to get dehydrated and not good for you. And then their third rule is eat as much as you want and anything you want as long as you can pick it, pluck it, or kill it. Now, if you think about those rules, they're, they're, there's some similarity with Michael, Michael Pollan, keep it non-processed food. But other than that, the 20-year-old you know, Stanford guys are eating a lot of protein, and they're eating a lot. And so there's some overlap with Michael Pollan, but it's, but it's a different situation uh, of a 20-year-old football player versus a middle-aged man. To make it more businessy, the simple rules depend on the person in the situation. Indiegogo versus Kickstarter. 
At least initially, they had different rules. In fact, I think they still do have different rules, simple rules for what, what kind of a project could be on their site. The Indiegogo rules were anything goes as long as it's legal. You want to you wanna fund your European vacation, your dental work, your startup, your movie, your Jamaican bobsled team, whatever you want to fund as long as it's legal, you can give it a try at, um, at Indiegogo. In contrast, the Kickstarter, Kickstarter it has, is more, a little bit more rule bound. Basically wants your project to fit into one of 13 categories and there are curators at, at Kickstarter to ensure that that's the case. Indiegogo takes almost everything. Kickstarter kicks out about 25% of the projects that are actually trying to go on the site. Why are the situations different? They're different. I think the difference in the rules is reflected by who the founders are, at least in part. The Indiegogo founders are UC Berkeley folks who think that um, the internet is for everybody, and everybody deserves a shot at a rich uncle to get them the money they need. It's a very egalitarian point of view. In contrast, Kickstarter is funded, it was started at least in part by a founder who was, uh, who saw Kickstarter as a way to publicly fund the arts. And art, art funding is often a curation model, so they have much more of a curation model. Third point, civil rules relate to a well-defined activity. Picking crowdfunding projects in the case of Indiegogo and Kickstarter, or choosing food in the case of Stanford Football and uh, Michael Pollan. So it doesn't apply to your decision to get married, which is hopefully a one or maybe two time decision. Um, and it doesn't reply to solving massive problems, like there aren't simple rules for solving world hunger. Um, it's rather a well-defined activity uh, like product development, uh, acquisition decisions, hiring decisions, that sort of thing. Okay, that's, that's simple rules 1.0. Simple rules 2.0 is that there are different kinds of rules. And it turns out that it matters that they're different kinds because some of them are harder to learn than others and because the harder to, want, harder to learn ones actually tend to have more payoff. Uh, so it's tell you a little bit easier and harder. Also, a more complete variety of rules tends to be more effective as well. So let me tell you about, I'm not gonna tell you about all the kinds of rules, but let me tell you about a couple kinds so you get a, get a flavor for it. First of all, is boundary rules. Boundary rules are rules for picking what to do, yes or no, which alternative should I choose? So for example, the Weinstein Company has some boundary rules for movie picking. The Weinstein Company did um, The Artist, The King's Speed, uh, back in the day, Chocolat, Pulp Fiction, a whole bunch of movies over the years. And when you think about the range of movies, they did The Imitation Game, they did Silver Linings Playbook, you say, what's, what unites those? Because that's really quite a lot of, uh, at least on the surface, different kinds of thematic content. And it turns out there's a couple simple rules. One, a, a Weinstein movie is always about a flawed but sympathetic main character. So in this picture of The Imitation Game, uh, which is Alan Turing, uh, Alan Turing is portrayed as kind of a jerk, but you like him. I'm told in real life he actually wasn't a jerk, but it worked for the movie rule that he was a jerk, so they actually made him more jerk-like than he really was. Uh, secondly, uh, or Silver Linings Playbook, the, the protagonist in Silver Linings Playbook um, is again, has struggles with mental illness and is annoying in a number of ways, but you still like that person. So it was flawed but sympathetic main character. The King's Speech was the King of England. Um, again, he was a flawed person, but, but you tended to like him. So flawed but sympathetic main character is the first point. Second point is it's always related to a, a basic human condition. In the case of um, uh, the imitation game, it's being uh, gay and, and when being gay is illegal in, in England. Silver Linings Playbook is obviously about mental illness. And then there are a couple of rules that are around cost and, and how much basically there's a, there's, a cost, uh, there's a cost max at which point they share and a couple of other things. But those are the basic ones. Um, there's also a rule about there, every movie should have a beginning, a middle, and an end, which seems kind of obvious. Although if you think back to Pulp Fiction, it actually begins at the end. So you have to have the parts, but it doesn't have to be in the right order. Does that mean, so now you're saying to yourself, well, isn't that every adult movie? Well, actually it's not. First of all, Mission Impossible tends to be constant action with no story, at least my take on it. So it wouldn't be a Weinstein movie. Um, and then and there's also, a, and then if you think of a movie like Gone Girl or The Birdman, there are no sympathetic characters in that, those movies. Those, everybody's, everybody's annoying in those movies. And so they wouldn't, be, they wouldn't fit that bill either. So within a small number of rules, you get a lot of artistic creativity and one of the most uh, also financially successful the Hollywood movie studios. Now to make it a company you probably don't know anything about, this is a company called Frontier Dental. 
And their problem is a relatively small company. They're an innovative company that does, um, their innovations are around crowns, veneers, and inlays of teeth. And they were trying to sell their products, and they were getting about a 3% hit rate, as they call on dentists, which, as you might guess, was not real effective when you're a small company. So they looked over their experience and thought about who was the ideal dentist. And they came up with some, a couple of simple rules. One was that they, they thought the ideal dentist would be between the ages of 35 and 55, or 50, 35 and 50, because you know, establishes a practice but not ready to retire. But the problem with that rule was it's actually hard to tell how old a dentist is. So they went to a different rule, which was, does the dentist have an innovative website? So the first rule was they actually started using, does the dentist have an innovative website? The second rule was to look at the finance history of the dentist, and did the dentist have no more than two finance charges in a year? So innovative dentists who pay their bills and went from essentially a 3% hit rate to something like a 67%, two-thirds percent hit rate. Um, by just changing to a few simple rules that really focus their sales calls and then developing a relationship on the dentists who are really likely to buy. Let me just say, I won't say too much about DARPA, but DARPA also has simple rules about uh, picking projects that they work on as well as, crowd, as, well as crowdsourcing innovation. One of their, one of their, a couple of their rules on crowdsourcing competition is asking themselves questions. Do we know, who's the, do we know who has the solution or do we know where to look? If the answer is no, they crowdsource. They also have some decision rules around the kind of project that are typically around being in Pasteur's quadrant, that is commercially relevant and scientifically hard, a place that actually most people don't play. So that's boundary rules. Let me tell you a little bit about how-to rules. Let me see how our time is. Yeah, how-to rules are guiding, guiding what it is you're going to, going to do. Let me do a rock band for you. This is the white stripes, the white stripes produced the White Blood Cells album, which is one of the massive albums of the 2000s. They published, they, they, they created that album in 10 days. They did 18 songs in 10 days. How did they do it? Well, this is obvious not, they're not, these are not real rule-bound guys, but they did have a couple of rules for their album. No covers, meaning they didn't do anybody else's song. No guitar solos, no slide guitar, no bass. Within those rules, creating creative songs. And one of the, I think, one of the, I think, surprises, particularly of innovation, is it turns out no rules is not is actually difficult to innovate with no rules. In fact, rules actually create constraints and make you think harder about what it is you need to do and give you a place to start. So, the, where the creativity is really coming in, or one is a part of the creativity, is coming in and choosing your own rules, which is what the White Stripes did. A couple simple rules. The company that you probably know pretty well is, is Airbnb. Airbnb started, as you, as you may know the story of Airbnb, they stumble around for quite a while trying to figure out how to make the business model work, trying to make Airbnb work, finally end up at Y Combinator. Y Combinator folks tell them to go to New York and they kind of figure it out. And what they figure out, what becomes a key process for them is, is hosts. And if you think about the problem, how do you have host rules for people who may be hosting in their apartment, in their Tuscany villa, in their tree house, in their campsite, in their regular home, all kinds of places. And it turns out, at least to start, there were a couple of simple rules that gave, gave Airbnb some edge, and these were the rules for their hosts. One was always get professional photographs. And professional photographs made, gave a Airbnb property a slightly better look than, let's say, home away, or um, some of the VBO, I forget what the, the letters are for that. But essentially gave them a little bit better look, a little bit of an edge, and started to, to sort of tip into a positive cycle. Uh, another rule was around, was around all, for, for hosts, always give local tips. Where's the farmer's market? Where's the nearest subway stop? Um, stuff like that, local things. And the idea there was to give it more of a personal feel that would distinguish Airbnb from a hotel. Then the third one was, I think, kind of an interesting one. It was always have fresh soap. It turns out it's real obvious that you're supposed to vacuum and dust. But people were often not freshening up the soap because you just sort of forget about it. And yet that's, that's, that has a huge ick factor for a lot of guests. And so by just that one little rule that reminded, oh, yeah, we got to really clean up. And oh, by the way, fresh soap. And then finally, a, another how-to rule. I'll, I'll tell you, this is actually some, some of the executives at Twitter they were finding they were spending too much time in useless meetings, possibly something you're familiar with. Um, 
But in any event, uh, they came, a couple of the executives came up with some rules, which we'll see if they're working or not, but they're trying them out. One is no PowerPoints, because it takes people too much time to make them. And when people have PowerPoints, they talk too long. Um, the second thing is you can't cancel out of a meeting, because a meeting usually is three, four, five people. And if one person cancels out, it screws up the meeting for everybody. So once you've committed to be at a meeting, you've got to actually be there. You can't cancel out at the last minute. So those are two of the, those how to rules and boundary rules are pretty easy rules to learn. People usually get those pretty fast. Timing rules are harder. And they're really about when are you going to do something, deadlines, rhythms, so on. And what they do is they, they're useful for getting things done once timing matters, obviously, but also getting things going and keeping momentum. Let me give you a couple rules. This is actually an example from Pixar. When Pixar, Pixar's original movie was Toy Story, and it took the Pixar folks about four years to develop Toy Story. Well, it turns out that if you can only do a movie every four years, it's not really very commercially viable. And people, creative people really don't want to only have a product once every four years. At least creative artists don't want to do that. And so they're having, so that was a problem. And so to maintain the quality level that they wanted, but, but, the, but the commercial value, they had to do something different. And so they actually went to a timing rule, which took them several years to actually implement it. But it was basically introduce one movie a year and introduce it at November, which is when the start of the big holiday season for kids' movies is. And so it took them a while to figure out how to essentially have divide their process into year one, year two, year three, year four, so on. But essentially, they created a factory of movies, where there'd be a year one movie, a year two movie, a year three movie, and a year four movie, and, and roll it out. What that did was obviously let them synchronize around November. It let them synchronize the processes and the hands off uh, among the people. Again, it took them a while to do it. They, sometimes they miss it. For example, they missed it lately because they didn't think, um, I forget which movie it is, but a recent movie was up to their quality standards, so they actually slipped on that. They also sometimes will do a, a spring release as well, now that they're a bigger company. Another example of the timing rules comes from a, comes from a, a company you probably don't know, uh, in an industry you probably don't know. But this is a concrete company. It's a construction company. You may, you may know this. You may know that cement, which is part of, which is an ingredient of concrete, is one of the biggest polluting sources of CO2 in the world. I think it's number two or number three. It's a massive uh, um, polluter, both in the, in the production of it. Um, and what these guys did was develop a concrete that was less polluting to make and also lasted longer because it, you could use less of it, you could, because it didn't crack as much, and you could use less of it. So it was a really a, a, an important environmental product. They went to Las, well, actually, they, interestingly, they, they, um, they figured out this product by, first of all, going back to the ancient Egyptians, who were the originators of concrete, and then looking at Romans. The ancient Romans also used a lot of concrete. And they found out that horsehair and blood is particularly useful for getting better concrete. So they sort of tried to think, what's the 21st century equivalent of those, and essentially engineered a new concrete. They went to Las Vegas with their new concrete uh, to some trade show, and a lot of a lot of people around the world were very interested in this product. And so they were sort of left with this problem of, well, there's hundreds of contractors who want to work with us. How do we decide? And so they actually came up with some simple rules to figure out how to do that. One, they wanted no geographic overlap, so each person had their own territory. The second one was, how do we figure out who's a good contractor to work with? And they came up with a rule that was a lot like the dentist example. If the contractor has a laser screed machine, we want to work with them. And I don't know what a laser screed machine is, and you probably don't know either. But apparently, it signals that this is an innovative, high quality, and relatively large company that's likely to be a good partner. And then the third rule was around the number of partners they would get. They were a small company. They felt they could onboard a partner every three months. So every three months, a new partner. Every three months, a new partner. Um, and they, what they, basically, they quadrupled their revenue in a year. Um, and had a roughly, they figured, about 80% hit rate on successful partners. Finally, just one last kind of rule is a stopping rule. These are the hardest kind of rules to, to learn. When do you sell a stock? It's easy to buy a stock. It's really hard to sell one. It's maybe easy to start a dating relationship. It's really hard to end one. Um, so sort of simple rules for ending things turn out to be hard to do and, and yet important. In fact, particularly important. 
So Primquist, our concrete guys, they also had a simple rule for stopping, and that was if our partner's not using our products within three months, it's time to, it's time to end the relationship. So three-month window, our partner uses our product, they don't use it, we're out of there. Stopping rules, I don't know if you all know Steve Blank. Steve Blank uh, is a, he's a sort of self-styled guru. He is involved with what's known as the Lean Launchpad, the Lean Startup Movement. That sort of thing. He teaches at Stanford, Berkeley, Columbia, a couple different places. Anyway, he has some advice for startups, but or starting up of any business. Uh, his first set of rules are around around more how-to rules, which are around talk to 100 people, do it outside the building, and talk to face to face about the product, your product, wherever you think your product's going to be. But he also has some importantly, and I think maybe more importantly, some stopping rules. After you've talked to a bunch of people. The stopping rules are around, um, do customers see that they have a problem? Do they see that your product will solve that problem? Will they pay for your product? Can you actually make your product? If your answer um, is what? Yes, all four, then you go ahead. If it's no to anyone, it's time to stop, pivot, go to a new product. So does the customer see a problem? Will they pay it? Will they pay you? And uh, can you actually do it? Finally, another stopping rule to, to go to a different genre. Uh, you, may, maybe many of you have read the Into Thin Air book, the John Krakauer book, um, on the Everest climb that uh, resulted in the largest tragedy on Everest ever, at least at the time. This was in 1996. It was 16 clients, two world-class climbers, and, and a lot of very skilled Sherpas. Um, they were trying to summit Mount Everest. And the simple rule of Scott Fisher, who was the expedition leader and the company owner, was if you're not on top by 2 o'clock, you turn back. Wherever you are at 2 o'clock, turn around. You're done. Well, that day they didn't. That day, one of the clients had tried before, come very close, hadn't made it, really wanted to get there. A couple other clients were pressuring. And they were up at the top at 4 in the afternoon, not 2. On the way down, they were hit with avalanches, and eight people died. So I wouldn't say that all stopping rules are this important, but certainly this was a, an important and critical rule. A simple rule that was you know, in the dead zone. You could remember it, but they got tempted and, and ignored it. So that's, that's kind of some ideas around different kinds of rules. There are a couple other kinds of rules, but that probably gives you a flavor of, of different sorts of rules. Now you're probably wondering, which is what this is about, is how do you actually think about creating simple rules? Simple rules, and by the way, simple rules for raising your kids, for dieting, for hiring people, for making acquisitions, for doing product development. You can have simple rules for all sorts of things. So I thought I'd spend just a couple minutes and talk a little bit about that. There are really three steps. This is obviously here. Determine the objective, find the bottleneck, craft the rules. Uh, determine the objective is what are you trying to accomplish? What do you want more of or less of? Do you want a... Do you want to be more physically fit? Do you want your child to behave better? Do you want to have better employees? Do you want more revenue? Do you want lower costs? What is it that you're trying to achieve is really the first step. The second step is finding the bottleneck, what's really keeping you from that. And then the third step is to come up with the rules. So let me walk you through a couple examples to give you the idea of what's up. Here's an example of House of Cards. Um, House of Cards, I would guess most of you are familiar with, the Netflix show. Um, the Netflix problem at the time was that content was becoming enormously expensive for them. They were basically using somebody else's content and streaming it. And it was becoming extremely expensive to get that content. And so they decided to go into their own created content. And the, the challenge was not just to have a good show, but have a show that would stand out and be like way out there in terms of press and visibility and engagement of audiences. So not just, a, not just another show, not just, not just a Sopranos quality show, but in fact a show that would create enormous buzz so they could stand out from HBO and from the other creators of, of top quality content. And so they had to do something unusual. And it wasn't going to be just great writing because those other shows all have great writing. You know, Mad Men. I mean, there are, there are lots of shows, not lots of shows, but there are a number of shows with great writing. So what do you do if you're trying to be really different? And what they did, and, and so, this is, so what's different about 
Well, I mean, I, I, I'm getting into the story, but let me, let me step back to what the point is. The point was for them was how do we do something striking you on unusual that will stand out? Not just more, not just more revenue, not just lower costs, but really stand out. I'll tell you a little bit about then how they did it, but the key point here is around the objective. They, they had great writing, um, and that was certainly important to them, but they also decided to look for different ways to really be different from everyone else. And the bottleneck they chose, and I'll talk a little bit about bottlenecks next, but the bottleneck they picked on was directing. Every, lots of, in other words, lots of shows have good content and good writing, but they don't necessarily have great, unusually good directing. And so the original director of House of Cards was David Fincher, who did The Social Network, Girl with a Dragon Tattoo, basically an A-list movie director directing for television. The second thing that they did was then, they, then he was allowed to bring on board other A-list directors like um, uh, Charles McDougall, uh, Alan Coulter, who did The Soprano, who did The Office, those two guys, other top A-list directors, and then just gave them a couple simple rules. They all had to do two episodes. Those two episodes had to be in a row. They had to do it in a 20-day shoot. Uh, they had to, they could get their own day player, so they couldn't change, they couldn't change Kevin Spacey and Robin Wright, but they could change the players that were, that they would, that, that were being introduced in, the, in their part of the show. And they had final cut um, opportunity. So they did that. And then finally they encouraged them but didn't require them to use a stationary camera. And so what the point here is that they chose a different bottleneck, which was directing, and got A-list people to do it and created what I think one of the things that makes House of Cards unique is the, is the cinematic quality. And so they created a differentiator around the cinematic quality. They also created a differentiator and a, and a different way of, of standing out by their programming. The, the binge watching, they did the binge watching as you have to you all, they really originated that. The second thing that they did that you may not know was they also bought House of Cards episodes for two years, which is kind of unheard of in the media industry. Most of the time there's a trial and then, then you buy the whole thing. They bought two years, which locked up the content at a, at a less expensive price. Why could Netflix do that, by the way? Both buy House of Cards for two years uh, and do binge watching? Because as they said, we knew before you knew that you were gonna like House of Cards. And we knew before you knew that you'd binge watch. And they knew that because they had it from their own data. They knew that Netflix subscribers like David Fincher, they like House of Cards, and that they were already binge watching. And so what was a big risk for a media company was not a big risk for Netflix. And then the final way they tried to change the game and, and stand out was in their choice of talent. So Ke having Kevin Spacey on television, having an A-list actor on, on television uh, was unusual. And that's, that's characteristic of, of both behind the camera as well as on camera. Uh, stars, which is again consistent with what Netflix often does. Top, top talent, pay top dollar, and let them do their thing. So, so that, that first example is about, actually it's about a lot of things, but it was certainly was at least started out about being about objectives. Thought maybe I'd say something about Google. A little Google picture here. Um, I, I don't know if you all, do you all know, I don't know if you know Shona Brown, who Shona Brown was? Yeah, she was the senior VP of operations when Google went, went public. Uh, and she was also my PhD student. Um, so I, I, I've known Google for a long time, uh, you know, through Shona. Um, but she, uh, I, I, you know, among other things, ran HR. And this is about bottlenecks, because the, I told you there's three steps. What's your objective? What's your, what's your bottleneck? What are your rules? The bottleneck is the hardest one to figure out. And that's because it's hard to tell. For example, let's say you want to be more physically fit. Well, does that mean you should improve your diet? Does that mean you should exercise? Does that mean you should, what should you do? There are lots of things. Your sales aren't working. Is it your product? Is it your sales force? What is it? What's the bottleneck? In the case of Google, the, there were challenges with a number of potential rivals, which in retrospect don't look so powerful, but at the time did. Yahoo, Microsoft, for example, uh, in search. And so what was the bottleneck? The bottleneck wasn't products. The bottleneck was computer science talent. And so, so Google had several simple rules about getting top computer science talent. Beyond the obvious of good grades from, from good schools, it was around things like um, always hire people who are a little eccentric because they tend to be more creative. So look for somebody who's done something weird. Uh, 
look for people who are referred to by other Googlers, because other Googlers will get what Google is looking for. And never hire anybody who's, who's fudged on their resume, because we don't want low integrity people. There's some other rules too, but some fairly simple rules that were beyond the obvious of, let's hire somebody from Carnegie Mellon who is smart. Um, there were also some rules around acquisitions, because that was the other way to get computer science talent. And the size of the acquisition and how, how, and how to integrate it. So for example, do acquisitions between 10 and 15 employees. And you sort of get a package of people. So the point is that, creating, that bottlenecks are important. Bottlenecks are important here at Google around hiring computer science people. Bottlenecks were important at House of Cards around directing, creating new bottlenecks around directing um, programming and, and, and talent. How do you create rules? Well, there are a couple ways to create rules. Um, what you're typically looking for is analyzing your own past experience. What's worked for you and what hasn't? The second thing is getting expert advice from a book, from a consultant. Um, and then third is usually something about getting some advice from peers or friends. So in the example, in the book we have an example about internet dating, about how to do it better internet dating, um, where the guy in the story um, uses those three tactics. But I'll do more of a business example, which is Zatizi. Zatizi is a, uh, a food caterer in Prague. And they were, a, they were, fine, they were fine dining, had, you know, owned a number of restaurants in Prague, and decided to go into catering for Western companies, like Google, like Facebook, like Cisco who wanted to give their employees better quality food. Uh, and so they you know, got the contracts with some of these companies and started running cafeterias, company cafeterias. And they were losing a ton of money. And so what did they do? How are we, how are we going to start making money? Everybody loves our food. Everybody's going to our cafeteria, but we're not making any money on it. And so what they did is they started analyzing their own experience. And had the chefs do it, not just the, not just the, the bureaucrats, but the, the chefs as well, the people who were actually doing it. Um, and they started to realize that what they were doing was the chefs were enjoying doing novel cooking. And they did probably 1,000 different menus in a year. So it was, it was very creative, but it was, it was not very standardized. They also were not particularly paying attention to local sourcing and seasonal ingredients. And they were not doing some other things. So they looked over what they were, were up to and came up with a couple of simple rules about how to about how to uh, manage their, their cafeterias more effectively and, and pick their menu more effectively. So they decided their problem, to go back to the steps, their objective was more profit, their bottleneck was menu selection, they decided, and their rules were around things like became fix the menu by noon on Wednesday the week before, do five dishes every day, three have to be best sellers, do two dishes every day that are the same across all the cafeterias, and 90% of your, your food should be locally sourced or seasonally appropriate. Um, and within a few months, they, they, they raised their revenue. But more importantly, they doubled their profit. And then they be, started to be able to scale and grow. Um, so the example here is about going back to your own experience, seeing what's working, what's not. They didn't particularly ask outside experts, but you certainly could do that kind of thing and come up with the rules. So overall, that's, that's the basic idea. Leave with a. A well, picture of Leonardo da Vinci. The pitch here is, in a complex, uncertain world, whether you're Edmund Montoya getting bombed in, a, in Iraq, or you're trying to run food service in Prague, or you're trying to run product development at Google, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. But why do simple rules work? They, they, work, they work for three reasons. One is, um, if you have too many rules, it's bureaucratic, and you, you're kind of drained in. And if you have no rules, it's really too crazy. You can't get anything done if there's no rules, because there's no, you can't get any efficiencies. And so it's, it's, it's that in between. I don't know if you all follow complexity theory, edge of chaos. Essentially, edge of chaos, complexity theory stuff. So that's the first reason, is, it's, is it puts you between chaos and efficiency. Uh, in fact, I'll, actually, I'll give you an example, because um, the pope's in town, or he's sort of in town. He's in the country anyway. Um, <laughs> One of the great entrepreneurial success stories of the 17th century is the Jesuits. And Pope Francis is a Jesuit. And they, they broke away from what all the other priestly orders were doing. All the other orders would have like, these big rule books, like when you, when you were supposed to wear slippers, and which spoon to use, and when you could talk, and when you couldn't, this stuff. The Jesuits had, had only a couple rules. Get out of the monastery, get out of Europe, save souls, give a priority to education. 
and they became by far the most successful order in the Catholic Church. And they went from, they, have, they run what, 40 schools in India, for example. Um, so amazingly, it, entrepreneurial story of the 16th century. So simple rules are very entrepreneurial. Second reason why they work is because um, you make better decisions, partly because you save effort and time, which is the classic rule of thumb. But there are also certain situations when you have a relatively small N and when you have highly correlated data, you can, if, you, if you're just running data analytics on it, you'll actually overfit. Um, and so what you're actually trying to do is not overfit. And so you're actually backing down on the number of rules that you could actually create. Uh, so for example, um, college students were asked to use rules to decide which courses they would take. And the students that were primed to have many rules, like to have 10 rules, were less satisfied than the ones that just used a simple rule like, take the courses my friends say are good. That, that made them more happy. Because what it happens is if you have too many rules, people aren't good at, at correctly weighting. So we tend to, if you have 10 criteria, we overweight things that are really not important to us. And so it's actually better to cut the number, plus it fits in, in, in a, if you have issues with overfitting. And you could, the other reason they're good is because you can do them when you're tired. When you're tired, you're stressed out, you're hungry, whatever. You just have to remember one thing or two things. Um, and then the third reason why they work is actually they're better for coordination in big companies or big, situa big, big organizations. Because if you have a whole lot of people who have to coordinate, there are only a few things. They're easy to communicate. They're easy to remember. A lot of people can do them. So um, for example, the original Wikipedia rules were everything has to have two factual sources. You can't give your opinion. And then there are no, don't follow any other rules. And those were the rules that Wikipedia had when Wikipedia grew. Now Wikipedia, if, you ever, if you've tried to post on Wikipedia, it's a zillion rules. And it's basically a bunch of Wikipedian guys running it, which is why there's like hardly any women's content on there. Um, and they can't break through the rules. To what extent is awareness of, of biases, like implicit and explicit, how does that factor into the creation of, of rules when you sit down to make them? OK, well, usually when people start out, they don't make very good rules. And they, I don't know if you all know heuristics and biases and Danny Kahneman, if you've read that book, Thinking Fast and Slow. It's basically a, a, it's a negative take on heuristics. And it is true that when people initially come up with rules, they often aren't very good. So we were working with some Finnish entrepreneurs and looking at their internationalization process. And they all were starting out with rules like always sell in the Baltics. Which was largely, well, we know the Baltics. I mean, yeah, we know the Baltics. We know Sweden. In fact, they all went to Sweden first, because we all know Sweden. Sweden's also a language in Finland and so on. So people usually come out with fairly lousy rules. It's when they start to think about it and improve them that you get better rules. So initially, they are kind of bias bound. But if you work at it, you can get more strategic rules. And then if you actually track your progress over time, which is what some of the companies we were working with did, uh, you can then start to actually make those, the rules better and more strategic. So I'm thinking about my own job here. Yeah. I work in sales. And I was wondering if everything feels like a bottleneck. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how to identify what the true bottleneck is, if you could talk about that process, if there are any tricks. Yeah, and that, that is, that's probably the hardest. Because if you're in sales, you're probably saying, well, is, is it not selling because my product's not good, my sales force isn't good? Um, you know, there, there are probably 10 different reasons why something isn't working. There isn't, that's, that's the one that's probably the hardest to figure out. You don't have time to tackle, although House of Cards to some extent did multiple bottlenecks, but you don't have time to tackle one. So you, you and I, one of the tricks I have seen is that if you ask not people who work with you, but maybe somebody slightly outside, somebody in product development, somebody in HR, somebody, somebody in some other part of Google, to look at your, at your function, they may be able to come at, at your function with, with a fresher perspective. And may give, they may give you lousy ideas, but, may, but I've often seen they're able to give you good ideas. Yeah, I was working, in fact, I was working with an R&D group, and they were having issues around what, what projects should we actually focus on. And they realized if they asked some other people around the company, they'd actually get really good insight into where they were doing well and what they weren't. So I mean, you, might try, you might try asking friends. If I were to try to apply some of these simple rules to my own career development mm -hmm. during this season of PERF, as it were. Um, what are some ways that I might be able to apply some of these rules, not, know, not necessarily externally, but internally? Yeah, I think what you'd, what you'd want to do is, is what, do you, what are you trying to achieve with your career? Would you like, you know, do you want to have a managerial role? Would you like more free time for you know, family and fun? 
Um, do you want to you have more engagement in some sort of social mission? You know, what is it you really want to achieve is, is probably the first step. And then secondly, you think about, well, what's keeping you from that? Uh, is it because you're in, I don't know what would be keeping you from that. You know, is it, is it that you're, you're in the wrong jobs now, you're, you don't work effectively in some way or whatever? And then you might start thinking of some, some rules that would help you do that. Um, so I would think hard about what it is you're trying to actually accomplish for yourself. And then, then think about what's the bottleneck. And maybe also look back again. Looking back at your own experience is very valuable. Um, and saying, when were you really jazzed about your job? And when were you saying, you know, this is really working for me? You try and try and decode that. And as I just said to this guy in sales, maybe ask some people who know you, your, your, your friends and family, or people, you know, friends here at Google, who are maybe a little outside of your, your workspace, who can, who can take a bit more of an objective view on, on what you're good at, what you're not, what you want. Sometimes other people can surprise you in how perceptive they are about you. Would you ever correlate simple rules to goals? Because I think there are certain things that you're saying that sounds like simple goals, goals um, in terms of defining rules and defining goals. And do people in reading this apply it to that as well? Or they, do you find them distinctly separate? I don't think, I mean, one can make a distinction between objective, this is the goal I'm trying to achieve, and then a goal that might be some behavior, like I'm only going to eat plants. That would be my goal. So goal, goal can be goal. Goal is, is a less precise term. Yeah. So I, I would say nobody ever asked me that before. All right. And I encourage you all to check out the book. It is the um, the nerdy business book of the summer by Bloomberg. Yeah, Bloomberg Business yeah, called the nerd book of the summer. And yeah, it's been pretty amazing the kind of results that that we've been getting by just getting people to to think about what are the two things, two or three or four things I really have to do. Um, and focus on those and forget all the other stuff. But simple rules work because they put you between efficiency and, and, and chaos. They work be, efficiency and flexibility is probably a better way to put it. They work because you make better decisions. They work because you can coordinate people. Well, thanks a lot for spending a Friday afternoon with me. And um, I hope, uh, hope you keep it simple. <laughs>